In this segment, I'm going to talk about some installation procedures. Right before you start up a system for the first time, there's some very critical steps that must take place, and you must do them properly for the system to have a long, healthy life. Now, some of these steps there's a lot of debate about, and for some machines, it varies from manufacturer to manufacturer and from model to model. So for this video, we're going to take a few steps and kind of hone in on them and look very deeply into what we're supposed to be doing right before we start up a system for the first time. If you do any kind of forced air zoning, the EWC controls app is a must have. There's a bypass size calculator, an EWC product selector, and EWC products are the premium in zoning supplies. To find out more, you can go to ewccontrols.com or search EWC controls on the app store. For years and years, I used the same old style nitrogen regulator to test line sets. I would put about 150, 200 pounds of nitrogen in a line set, and then if it held for a little while, I knew I was good. Nowadays, digital gauges and wireless probes have procedures built into them where you can do a temperature compensated test, which is nice because we use nitrogen for testing because it doesn't vary a whole lot between changes in temperature. As we know, refrigerant changes very greatly. If the temperature goes up 10 degrees, there's going to be a big pressure jump as well. But for nitrogen, it only goes up a fraction of a PSI every few degrees, so it's much easier to work with for leak testing. You don't have any false positives for leaks, and you have more peace of mind when testing. So what is the proper PSI to test at? That's something that I've heard discussed for a long time, and it varies from machine to machine. Although you would think it's a standardized number that you can go back to time and time again, it's always best to look and see what the manufacturer suggests. So we're going to go back to the Bosch IDS2 manual, and I'm going to show you a page that might surprise you. Some mini split manufacturers, you'll see 500 PSI leak tests that go for 24 hours. On the VRF side, that's pretty common to have a high pressure leak test that lasts for a full day. But for Bosch, it just says 150 PSIG, relatively low compared to what you normally would test with. And I know that from time to time, especially as service techs out there in the field, we use a lot of nitrogen and we run out of nitrogen and we're testing at 107 PSI or 113 PSI. You can't drive to a supply house an hour away to get another bottle of nitrogen. You just let it sit there. But in optimum cases for the Bosch, it says use 150 PSI which to me seems like it's pretty low. I remember years ago when asking the guys at East Coast about Goodman pressure testing, and they said you could go up to 350 PSI. And I'm assuming that was the test pressure of the evaporator coil of condenser. I know some of them say on them what pressure they're tested at, so that's likely what they were quoting. But I know that I typically am satisfied if I get 150 or 200 PSI on a standard system. Another page out of the Bosch book goes into using leak testing bubbles. A lot of us carry bubbles around to test for gas leaks. Some of us use them to test for refrigerant leaks. Refrigeration Technologies, Big Blue, has been very popular for many, many years. I use that myself. Some of us carry around something as simple as household detergent like Dawn or something like that to test for leaks. And while you can test for leaks with something like Dawn, formulations like Big Blue are a little bit thicker and a little bit more robust for dealing with leaks that appear over time, whereas some of the other leak detectors, like household cleaners, tend to run off the pipe quickly. Something like Refrigeration Technologies Big Blue and their Sub-Zero especially stay on the pipe longer, and then you get to see those leaks that develop over time. Because it's funny how this works. You'll be testing for leaks, and the PSI reading on the gauge won't change very much, if at all, but you'll see the bubbles appear first. A lot of times that's true with very small leaks. You can actually catch them with bubbles before you can catch them on the gauge. And for those of us who have installed a new system and you only have X amount of joints of brazing to check or soldering, depending on how you do it, or flaring, depending on what you're working on, you know exactly where to test first. So using the bubbles might be a nice little shortcut and peace of mind to get to that leak quicker rather than waiting for a period of time and then having to hunt the leak down as well. Now I'm showing you guys a picture right now of a micron gauge that says 350 microns. Everybody has their opinion on how many microns you can pull down to. Some people say if you go too far, too low, that you're going to cause oil to vaporize. Some people say that if you hit a thousand, you're good to go. I used to say that about R22 systems in a service capacity. These regular unitary systems, if you go in there and you have serviced some old dirty system, 
and it's at a thousand microns and holds below a thousand, I used to say, hey, you're good and go about your business. I know there was some literature, although I think it was Goodman that said, if you got below a thousand, that you were satisfactory. Don't quote me on that one, but I did stick to that in the dirty system situations. But on newer systems, you're going to go a little bit lower than that. And you should be able to with ease. 350 microns is what the Bosch is saying in their manual. But it's not just saying that. It says to observe the micron gauge. Evacuation is complete if the micron gauge does not rise above 500 microns in one minute. So although you're going down to 350 microns, you want to sit there for a minute and make sure that decay doesn't rise above 500 microns. If you want a more intricate look at vacuum decay, you can go to something like the BlueVac app or MeasureQuick to see a graph of vacuum decay, and you'll get a pretty good idea, and I think it gives you a prediction as well, on whether or not your vacuum is going to be sufficient for your system. So a little shorter and sweeter on this particular tip. I hope this helps you guys out there that are learning the trade. And those of you who might have been around for a while, a little brush up right there. My name is Zach Ciota. As always, this is the HVAC Shop Talk podcast. You can contact me by emailing HVACShopTalk at gmail.com. As always, I'll see you guys on the next one. And God bless each and every one of you. Oh.